in the heart of Shropshire lies Weston Park, the family home of the Earls of Bradford. Built in the late 17th century in what's known as Restoration England, it sums up the confidence of those years. The perfect proportions, the symmetry of the design. We've moved on clearly from the higgledy-piggledy style of Tudor architecture, all those funny angles and half-timbered walls. Now, Britain was ruled by a comfortable landed elite, and they wanted everything just so. Everything perfect. To be honest, I'm not a great fan of this period of history. Britain had emerged from an epic bloodletting, a civil war between King and Parliament, and yet the only winners, as far as I can see, were a bunch of cosy landowners. And for the next hundred years, society was as stagnant and snobbish as ever, the rich man in his mansion, the poor man at his gate. And this vision of an orderly society extended not just to the ranks of society, but even to the environment in which we lived. Look at this, all this rolling parkland. It looks so natural, doesn't it? It's not. Every tree, every undulation, every view and vista on this estate was carefully planned by a famous landscape gardener, a man called Capability Brown. This, it seems, was an era in our history when the rich at least had money enough and time enough and confidence and arrogance enough to tame even nature for their own ends. Well, I want to tell the story now of another man. Nothing to do with this place at all, really, except that he lived quite close to here in a place called Colebrookdale, and he was a contemporary of Capability Brown's. And just like Capability Brown, he was making nature work for him. He was using the building blocks of this planet, the very raw materials of the earth, for his own purposes. And in so doing, he kick-started a revolution that would shake up this cosy, complacent, comfortable world forever and drag Britain into the modern age. And his name? was Abraham Darby. Colebrookdale lies just 10 miles south of Western Park, in the Iron Bridge Gorge, famous not just for its magnificent iron bridge, but as the birthplace of industry itself, the cradle of what's now called the Industrial Revolution. You drive through this gorge now, all you see are the ruins of blast furnaces, railways overgrown with weed, factories now converted into museums. Back in the late 18th century, though, witnesses talked in wonder of Colebrookdale as a grim and fantastical glimpse of hell on earth, the night sky burning with the fiery glow of the furnaces. This place, in 1770, was a vision of the future. I'm in an old Quaker burial ground above the village of Colebrookdale, the final resting place of Abraham Darby and his family. He was a third generation ironmaster, a maker of iron. His father was an ironmaster and his grandfather before him. And they were all Quakers, Christians, but outside the fold of the state church, the Church of England. And you often find it's people who are different who make a difference in society. They're the ones who cut through the tired old ways of doing things. They're the ones with the questing minds. And what the Darbys had done over three generations was to solve an age-old problem. How do you make iron fast, cheap, and strong as never before? We'd made tools out of iron for thousands of years. And for centuries, this gorge had been a center of iron production. All the raw ingredients were here, iron ore, wood to make charcoal, water to power the bellows, limestone, clay. The trouble was, by the turn of the 18th century, the forests were being cut down for timber and farmland. Wood was becoming too expensive to use as fuel, and the one alternative, coal, produced iron that was too brittle. The race was on to find a solution. This is the Museum of Iron in Colbrookdale, and this rather ugly roof here protects the blast furnace where Abraham Darby's grandfather, Abraham Darby I, finally 
cracked the problem. Now, it's all pretty technical, but basically what Abraham Darby realised was that it was the sulphur in the coal that was weakening the iron. And so he tried smelting iron using coke, a kind of low sulphur coal. And on this very spot, in 1709, he produced the world's first ever coke-fired iron. And his son, Abraham Darby II, improved his technique, making the iron stronger. And here we have Abraham Darby III inheriting the family business and putting this place, Colebrookdale, firmly on the map by casting out of iron the world's first ever iron bridge. It was intended, quite simply, as an advertisement. And when it opened for business on New Year's Day, 1781, it became an instant tourist attraction. People came in their thousands to marvel at the astonishing technology at work here. Here, at last, was a material, iron, strong enough to give substance to all kinds of world-changing ideas. Steam engines with iron cylinders powering machines with iron frames. Steam trains with iron wheels running on iron tracks. Nature now was our servant and it seemed the world would never be the same again.